Today, I want to compare the little Rogers LS35A with our Sibelius loudspeaker. Now, you might find that a rather strange comparison, and indeed it is, but it's because a number of people have asked us if we could make a smaller stand mount loudspeaker or ideally a bookshelf. And the answer is yes, we can, but we don't want to. And I want to explain why. And I think maybe it's interesting for some people to understand the fundamental difference in the design approach of a Sibelius loudspeaker than a small compact monitor. Basically, we have made a small bookshelf loudspeaker before. In fact, I designed it way back in 1977 and the first prototypes were made in 1978, just three years after the BBC finished the LS35A design. And at that time, we sent the prototypes off to Gramophone, Hi-Fi News, uh, I can't remember who it was, Electra and some German uh, magazines for their reviews. And we got very good coverage, in fact. But we never went into full production because A, it was very expensive to produce and B, the sound wasn't fantastic. It was good for a hobbyist to make their own. And we had a company at that time called DIY Hi-Fi where you could buy all the drawings and make them yourselves. But the fundamental idea was a single drive cone on a Paul Voigt type horn, front loaded like the Sibelius. Um, but of course, it doesn't really work in the sense that you don't have any real lower register and not even the appearance of as much as you would get with an LS35A. So in order to understand the limitations and why we don't want to invest any more uh, R&D budget on it, because we're happy with the Sibelius as it is, um, and, indeed, and we tried again in 2015-16 to see if we could recreate the bookshelf, but it just didn't work. It worked, but it, it wasn't of a high enough quality that I would want to put our product brand on it. And to be honest, there's better product, small product out there on the market than we could ever make. And the reason is this. If you take, for example, a double bass, when the bass player plucks or bows the string, the string vibrates over the bridge and the little feet of the bridge push against what is effectively the front plate of the double bass. And that thin piece of wood begins to vibrate and it pushes the column or box of air behind it. And the air is then forced out of the air holes in a very deep and powerful sound. It actually, <clears throat> excuse me, amplifies the sound. Well, that's exactly what's happening in the Sibelius loudspeaker, we've built a solid column or box of air. And when the cone vibrates in and out, it compresses the column of air inside the cabinet and pushes it out through the bottom. Now, the challenge was making sure that that wood does not interfere in any way with the sound of the wonderful drive cone that Mark Fenland designed for us. Now, Mark Audio, who produced our drive units, Mark developed a special edition for us. And the voice coil that's sitting inside this magnet here is wound with a very special form of wire, which gives the Sibelius its unique neutral sound, which is exactly what Rogers were trying to achieve. And the LS358 is famous for its mid-range, and I think ours is too. The big difference is, because we have this huge column of air, just like the double bass, in a good sounding room, a balanced room, we can produce bass from 36, 38 hertz upwards, right up to just under 20,000. Relatively, We can even get to 20,000, but relatively flat. And as a double bass player or a cellist would want to play a scale, every single note from the very lowest note to the highest it can go, 
without any of them being louder than another. That's what we've done by tuning the cabinet. And it's taken us a very, very long time to get that right. We've built that cabinet and approached that cabinet just like an instrument maker, like a, an organ builder would produce a pipe. And there were times in the factory that we were using wooden blocks as taps and tapping them in with a wooden mallet up and down and at the bottom too, to make sure that that port is exactly right. Because it's not a port as in a traditional ported cabinet, which is tuned in that respect. It's there to make sure that we get no boom at any one frequency in the lower register. And what happens is the, the, the drive cone here is taking over through a natural crossover function. There's no electronics or anything in there. It's just the silver plated copper wires linking to the terminal posts. And the drive cone takes over and, and takes us right up into the highest range, frequency range. So if we make a Sibelius speaker smaller down to the size of a Rogers LS35A, we would end up with a violin. Basically, there would be no lower register whatsoever. So what do the what did the BBC design team do to come up with the solution? was obviously they used a lot of electronics. So they made a sealed box and they created a crossover, an extremely complicated one with transformers, obviously capacitors, resistors, and then later on inductors and to, to hold back all the natural sound that's being produced by the drive cones at um, the higher frequencies. So for example, at around 1000, or 1,500 hertz, this little guy here, the B110 drive unit, would be pushing out something like close to 90 decibels, as with the T27. But obviously, lower down at, at 50 hertz or 70 hertz, it's not producing anywhere near that amount in this cabinet. So that has to be held back and suppressed with filters and crossovers, which we don't use, in the Sibelius. So basically the LS35A is a is technology trying to reproduce a natural balance of sound and in the Sibelius it's actually just the live recording being played through the transducer that the, the drive unit into the cabinet and it being produced well as naturally as possibly as, as you could possibly imagine. So how did this Rogers LS35A come about? Basically, the BBC wanted a small monitor speaker to put in all of their outside broadcasting vehicles. So then when they turned up for a concert or a live event, they would mic up the hall and the orchestra, the musicians or whatever, and then the cables would be run out into the street and plugged into the side of the outside broadcasting vehicle. And an engineer sitting in the back of that vehicle would be mixing the sound using these loudspeakers so that he or she could be sure to get the sound exactly how the BBC want it to sound. And in fact, they even built in a little, uh, should we say, blip increase in the frequency response. It's not completely flat. It's not like a studio monitor in that respect. At around 100 hertz, they made that little bit because it was emulating the sound of the best possible radios or hi-fi equipment that people might have in their houses at that time. So they knew that if it sounded good in the back of that outside broadcasting unit, it would sound good in people's homes all over the world. And these little speakers were sold all over the world and every BBC studio, internal studio, outside broadcasting event had the same speaker. And in fact, the BBC was so critical that they insisted that every single one was individually tested and that the results of those tests were printed on the back of the loudspeaker as, as a to proof. And it was a, a nightmare producing for the BBC because sometimes as many as, you know, three out of 10 or more of them would be rejected because actually they weren't up to the very, very strict specifications that the BBC set. And a number of manufacturers made them spend, a, a number of companies, Chartwell, made them under license for the BBC. So there's a lot of components, a lot of technology, a lot of research, a million euros was invested 
at that time, the equivalent of at that time, in just getting that crossover and ca thin cabinet combination. And the cabinet had to be thin because if it was fat, it would be too big. So they wanted it small. So they had to work with the parameters of a thin cabinet and then work out how can we make sure that that cabinet is not annoying because uh, normally it would be. These things weren't cheap. They were not cheap. I don't know what the retail price was then, but they were out of the reach of my budget in, in, in 1978. I can assure you when we were building ours, these were really for elite people. Kef made a, a, a simpler version, um, but without the, uh, the Rogers crossover, should we say, or the BBC crossover. So basically, that is the difference. Now, the amazing thing is that 45 years later, well, I'm still around and we're, we've finished our designs a few years back now. So we have no plans for changing the cabinet or bringing out a Mark II or a Mark III. And Mark Fenlon's team have assured us that they will continue to make the drive units for us, for Pearl Acoustics, our special voice coil version uh, for as long as we need to. But the amazing thing is that Rogers is still in production of this. I mean, and they are making exact identical copies of this loudspeaker today. And that's what I find incredible. And they're selling all over the world. Now, honestly speaking, how good is an LS358? You can't compare it with Sibelius. I mean, the Sibelius, when you listen to it, is full, it's big. It will fill a, a 30 square meter room beautifully. Um, you know, it's got an extra octave, of course, because it go right down, as I say, to 38 hertz, 36 hertz. No problem whatsoever, as long as the room's capable of it. If your room is a box and the bass that's being produced by the loudspeaker is bouncing back into the room out of phase, cancelling it out, it doesn't matter what loudspeaker you have, you will never hear those 38 hertz. So the room acoustics is very important. We've made a separate video on room acoustics, which you might want to check out if you feel you're not getting enough bass in your room. If you're if you're bought a product and the reviewers are saying, yeah, this has got a great bass response and you buy it and you get it home. You think, wow, it's not doing anything here. Well, maybe it's the room and very likely to be. Anyway, I digress. So basically you can't compare them. But the one thing you could say is similar is the naturalness of the mid-range. When the voice is coming through the LS35A and you're listening it to it from about a metre and a half, two metres back, it will really sound natural. And you can play uh, just a voice speaking or something and someone might even believe that there's a, a that person's in the room that's the reality that people rave about and also the the top end is not crazy it's not exaggerated in any way it's to emulate the sound that the bbc wanted their customers to hear in their living rooms and so all that beautiful smoothness in the mid-range you will get that exactly with the sibelius and that's really what we've been looking to to work with and work on are there better small studio monitors than the LS35A today? I think they are. I mean, when we're on our external broadcasts, uh, external recordings, when I'm recording string quartets and, and chamber music and pianos, whatever, I take a pair of Yamaha HS7s with us. Uh, they're active and they're there not to sound nice, but so that we can hear every single detail. And a loudspeaker that's sort of between the, should we say, the unpleasant but real accuracy of the Yamaha HS7s or the white series is the ATC SEM7, for example. That's a, a loudspeaker that is, again, a sealed box, no ported cabinet. You don't really want a ported cabinet when you're small and wanting accuracy because the port, depending on the room and depending on the situation, will really exaggerate or, or counteract and produce maybe booms at certain frequencies which you don't want. That's my opinion. But it's a sealed, the ATC SCM7 is, is sealed as well. And it's just obviously got 45 more years of, of refinement. Does it sound better? Does it sound nicer in your room? Probably not. That's really a total matter of uh, taste. But it will be more accurate and it won't have artificial bumps in it. And so, but you know, these are, these are lovely loudspeakers, don't get me wrong, but they're real collector's items now. They're, they, the old ones are like this pair, are collector's items, I say. So anyway, I hope that's explained it. We're not making a, a small uh, Sibelius speaker because it will sound like a violin instead of a double bass. Um, and the violins can be reproduced beautifully by the, the drive cone itself. That has no problem taking it up. And when it's 
boxed into the top of the Sibelius cabinet. We've designed it in such a way that it gives the real true natural warmth without exaggerating any element of it in that solid French oak cabinet, which is 3.3 centimeters thick. When we start, when we get the wood into the factory and start planing it down, it starts off as being 3.3 centimeters thick. The final product is a little bit thinner due to the sanding and the finishing process. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting and look forward to um, seeing you again in the next video. Enjoy your music.